It's so interesting that you use contrast and obstacle because, you know, the, the famous saying, and there's a book out uh, by Ryan Holiday called The Obstacle is the Way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's true. I mean, you can resist all you want. It's not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. And, you know, I was not, not everybody, I always have to remind myself that not everybody thinks the same way I do. When the pandemic hit, I was doing all kinds of cool stir crazy drives. Like I went to the Valley of Fire. There was nobody there. Oh, wow. I took a bottle of wine, some cheese and crackers, and I was there with the hawks flying above me. <gasps> it was spooky cool. Mm. So like, oh, I get chills thinking of it now. Um, Welcome, Erica, to Sunday Communion Podcast. It's great to have you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. We've known each other for 10 years. I think it was, was it um, 2012 when IMAX had their first IMAX? So yeah, it's been, so, it's been around that maybe a little bit before. Yeah, 12. Wow. Uh, so you were a big part of my journey because that transitioned what I was doing and I knew it was coming, but I didn't know how it was coming. You know, that inner knowing and your phone call was the, like a, a trajectory of shifting gears that was completely divinely guided. And I'm thrilled that you are and have been part of my journey. So I'm happy to have you on the podcast and to get to know you and your inner workings and your outer workings in more detail. So can you just start out with giving us a little background about you? I mean, go all the way back. Where are you from? Originally, it's a little town in Pennsylvania um, called Ephrata. It's in Amish country, but my, my parents weren't from there. They just, they were originally from Minnesota. So they traveled all over the place. And for whatever reason, they ended up there. So I have a little town in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. Grew up there. And then I've lived and worked all over the place. So I've lived and worked um, outside of New York City, in and around New York City, Washington, D.C., Orlando. And this is where I've and Las Vegas is where I've ended up living the longest. And starting in a small town in Amish country, how did that uh, impact you as a young child and, and really as an as an adult? Uh, you always ask great questions. <laughs> um, it, when I was growing up, interestingly, the story is in a small town, sometimes they get into more trouble than in a big city. Mm -hmm. I remember dating uh, a man from Brooklyn, and he used to get into all kinds of trouble growing up in Brooklyn. And, and then when he started hearing my background, he goes, oh, my gosh, you know, you you uh, you beat me to the punch. So it, it, in a small town, it's a little boring and we would get into, you know, I sowed all my wild oats before I hit college. Everybody else does when they hit college. For me, it was like, I kind of did that when I was growing up, but yeah. You wanted was, to get on with your life. Yeah. Let's and, get the party started. <laughs> yeah, get the party started. Have fun. Um, and believe it or not, the Amish party like crazy too. We had, I, I was in one of their barns one time and we were kicking it up like crazy. Oh, wow. <laughs> had no idea. Yeah. Um, so then you moved uh, to New York at what age? Well, first I ended up, I, I lived, I, I went to school in Pittsburgh. I went to art school in Pittsburgh. And then after I graduated, I ended up moving, um, well, I, I moved back home for a little bit. Then I, I went for a job in Washington, D.C. Um, at a very young age, I was director of marketing for a large mall there called Potomac Mills Mall. And then I was, I, I was in Philadelphia. I was the director of marketing for Spirit of Philadelphia, a harbor cruise vessel. In, uh, and then in New York City, I worked for right outside of New York City, but in and around for another attraction called Medieval Times. Um, and then I left without a job and ended up moving to West Palm Springs with my boyfriend for a little while <laughs> and then got called here. I never had been to Las Vegas at all. And 
I just knew the owner of this bus company, motor coach sightseeing tour company. And he said, I know you, I know I want you as our director of sales. You just need to figure out if you want to be here. So he flew me out and uh, introduced me to Las Vegas. And that was, and and then I lived here. I, I ended up moving to Orlando for a short bit of time and then back again to Las Vegas. So a little bit of everywhere. So did your art degree support you or help you in this career path that just seemed to fall into place? Did you really go after that career path? I did for a short while. I, but, and then I, and, and like any career path, it kind of got you, you, it's, it's a good start to life. And a lot of people then end up going elsewhere. And so I, I did some illustrations and, and stuff for books for Prentice Hall Publishing. So I didn't know that about you. Yeah. So, it, but it was, it, it was more technical illustrations, how to, you know, like this nut goes into this bolt goes into it. So it was, it was technically interesting, but not, you know, illustration interesting. I, I paint and do some things that are more what people would think art would be. I do that on the side. I had a, I actually did have one that was published in a note card with, along with a poem that my mom wrote for ALS. We did it um, and donated the note cards to, to ALS. Oh, yeah. that's very cool. Oh, yeah. So no, it, it, the art background is fun because it supports a lot of creativity in the exhibitions and events industry, which that's what I'm a part of. And I have one of those kinds of minds where I love to be creative, but I like to be operational. So I, I can go both sectors and it, it works for me. So. And it, it allows you to be fed in both those areas. Yeah. The meetings and events industry. So how did you segue from then once you came to Vegas? Walk us through that. Yeah. Um, so when I came to Las Vegas, the, the motor coach sightseeing tour charter company that I worked for, it was interesting. It was the largest black owned company in the state of Nevada. And it was, it was a real honor and a lot of fun to be part of that. I probably worked for them for you know, a couple of years. And I ended up then opening up Caesar's Magical Empire, which was an attraction in Caesar's. I, for whatever reason, I launched all kinds of new things. I just happened to be on the launch teams for trade shows like IMAX America, as you know, and, you know, attractions and all kinds of things. Um, so, and then I worked for Planet Hollywood Corporation regionally as a sales and marketing um lead and then ended up getting promoted internationally. That's why I moved to Orlando, which was their headquarters, and then moved back here. Um, so I've kind of worked all around, you know, and then I ended up, you know, I've had transportation in the background, a little bit of hotel, a little bit of, a, uh, you know, a lot of attractions. And then I ended up working for a general service contracting company that moves in large exhibitions and, and builds them. And, and that was GES. That's when I met you. Mm -hmm. And uh, through David Oliphant. God love him. Yep. Shout um, out to David. Yeah. Shout out to David. <laughs> so, and then I ended up uh, deciding to, to, I worked for another general contracting company after GES. I worked for GES for a long, long time. And then I worked for another general contracting company and decided to open up my own uh, exhibition and events industry of uh, business. So, and this is what I want to talk about as far as next chapter. So how did that decision come to you? Was that something that you just one day said, I want to do it? Or was it something that you, you know, you were stewing on for a while? And then it was like, oh, okay, this is the time. How did, how did you go about that process? That is an interesting story. So I was, when I was working for the, the, the last general contracting company that I worked for, they were going through transition, which was really, really stressful on everybody and extremely stressful on me. Um, I ended up having stage three adrenal distress. I almost, stage four is you're going to die. Collapse, <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's how stressful it was because when you're, you know, it's, it's okay to have anxiety for a short amount of time, but when it's extended with stress for a long period of time, that's when mm -hmm. illnesses like that pop up. 
And so I ended up leaving that job without another because I, my doctor told me to leave and I decided, you know, I have a lot of these clients that I've helped them launch their businesses. Why not, you know, bring them on because I act as a consultant for them anyway. And I know if I, if I worked with them, I could save them money with all the contacts that I have and I can help them. Uh, and then I can make money while I'm saving them money. Yeah. You know, and that's, I ended up just building from there. Some of those few clients that I had, you know, and, and when you help launch a business for someone, it's like your family. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I ended up launching all kinds of attractions throughout my entire career, including Potomac Mills Mall. We, we built some of those built, built Potomac Mills Mall while I was there. I mean, I didn't build it, but you know, the team together, we, we opened up chapters of that when you when you do that with a client and i've done that for several clients it's like they'll it's bonding thing for you yeah it's yeah. like yeah how can we make your business successful erica it was it's, yeah. i'm very blessed very blessed well and it it's not just everyone because it is a bonding experience but it's you Right. So you are, no, it's true. I mean, you, you have exceptional skills. You are a great communicator. You're authentic. And, um, and that builds relationships. Did you look back now? Your business is how old? Well, I launched it in 2017. And then I was pulled away a year after I started it, believe it or not, to, to, be, to become general manager for a local destination management company. And then the pandemic hit. So I was with them for a year. The pandemic hit and God must have said, okay, well, you know, everybody was laid off. So God must have said, you're going to revisit your company again. <laughs> I didn't want you to pull away from it. So yeah. um, I would say now five years total. And that's exactly where I wanted to go. So thank you for bringing that up. And that is that do you, in retrospect, reflecting on the journey, do you see how your obstacles or things that could be perceived as, I'm going to air quote bad because you know we don't do that, right? less than optimal, our contrast that you, you know, we all dealt with the pandemic. We all dealt with the, the traumas around that time and how it changed the trajectory of our lives. Many of us personally, professionally, and it, it hit the events industry big time. So do you reflect back on that as something that um, is a positive, that that contrast brought you to where you were really meant to focus anyway? I, you know, the saying, it's so interesting that you use contrast and obstacle because, you know, the, the famous saying, and there's a book out uh, by Ryan Holiday called The Obstacle is the Way. Mm -hmm. And it's it's true. I mean, you can resist all you want. It's not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. And, you know, I was not, not everybody, I always have to remind myself that not everybody thinks the same way I do. When the pandemic hit, I was doing all kinds of cool stir crazy drives. Like I went to the Valley of Fire. There was nobody there. Oh, wow. I took a bottle of wine, some cheese and crackers, and I was there with the hawks flying above me. <gasps> It was spooky cool. Mm. So like, oh, I get chills thinking of it now. Um, and so I would just do stir crazy drives. There were people that just, that I know, that just couldn't even go outside of their house. They were so fear ridden. Yes. And even though I have a lot of my own anxieties that I work with every day, you know, I think all of us are a work in progress with everything that we, that we need to think of to improve ourselves. It was just there. That was not, I wasn't afraid of the pandemic. I, it was what it was. There wasn't very much that you could do about it. So I ended up picking up a painting that I hadn't done for a while. And I ended up painting more. Um, and then a crazy stir crazy drives and all kinds of things that I could think of to do until we could. And I, I actually launched another program with I'm one of the founding members of Exhibition Think Tank, which was an international think tank 
that Matthias Bauer from uh, the UK, who's very involved in the industry, started. And then there were founding members like ourselves, and we all would meet consistently. We had subgroups. I was the co-leader of uh, our little subgroup called uh, Event Professionals Without Borders. And we would, there was somebody from Switzerland, somebody from Ireland, Scotland, Germany, a few of us in the United States in this little subgroup, the larger group was over 200. And we mm -hmm. had panels to discuss what we could do in the meantime with events digitally, um, what it looked like for us when we came out on the other side. We were really busy. We were talking about diversity, equity, inclusion in the industry. We were talking about all kinds of interesting hot topics, professionals all around the world just putting our heads together, think tank, to see, you know, where we could go with this. So we were, we, I was busy having, having fun growing. and growing, right? Yeah. Exactly. And how did that, how did you segue into your business from that space? Did you just kind of jump right in or was that after? We, Exhibitions and events started slowly coming back in the beginning of 2021 because and, and Las Vegas was a key. Everybody was actually looking at Las Vegas because we're the exhibition and event capital of the world. Um, however, we were more shut down than many because of our the elected politicians at the time, how they felt about locally, about, you know, our governor and our governor especially felt about being cautious with the meetings and events, not right or wrong. It's just what they, how they felt. And so our events industry here, a lot of the hoteliers and executives were really pushing hard, having all kinds of discussions with the politicians on how, and showing them how we could bring meetings back, you know, and in, in, in a safe way but through the pandemic. So they were showing what it looked like for a theater style, um, general session, what it would look like with an exhibition, how they would handle a, a clean, safe environment um, to try to influence them, the, the politicians to open us back up again. So slowly we came back with, with being allowed to have 50 or less in a room, no matter how the size of a room. One of my, my main clients that I deal with all the time is a high-end luxury whiskey experience. And I do every, you know, sometimes I'll help in a, an event with a one-off kind of um, assist. Like I um, help man it where I manage the on-site registration for San Diego Wine and Food Festival where we register 4,000 guests in an hour and a half. So I might do something like that. And then with, with the Universal Whiskey Experience, my um, long longest client, I've been with them for over 15 years, talk about family. They're like family to me. I'll do everything, you know, room procurement, content development. I, you know, will do marketing, budgeting, contract negotiation, everything for them. And we, because they, he, my client from Universal Whiskey Experience was hell bent on, he, he didn't want to, he was the last to cancel probably in the city because <laughs> his, his event was end of April. And we really shut down the city around that time during the pandemic. And the only reason he canceled, because all events were canceling left and right starting in February. And he was saying, I want to continue my event. And um, the hotel had to say, I'm sorry, but we're shutting down because we're told to by the governor. His event was one of the first then to come back. And he figured out a way to do it with 50 people or less. And, and we had... 50 of his connoisseurs fly in from all around the United most met, they we weren't the uh, international people were not allowed to travel yet into the United States so he brought 50 um around the United States one was from Alaska you know uh, who always the uh, an, an individual that always attends this event and we zoomed in um on the screen um, master blenders and gen fourth, fifth generation owners of these special scotches and, wow. and other high end luxury whiskeys from all around the world. We had one gentleman who like is a duke, I think, and, and lives in a castle. You know, just 
zooming in at two o'clock in the morning to discuss <laughs> how he made or, you know, his particular high-end luxury whiskey. It was really fascinating and, and everybody loved it. So it just little baby steps like that, you know, like even in the largest yeah. conventions, I remember helping, um, I'm part of show management for SHOT Show. And, you know, that was quite interesting. That's hunting. What is that? It's SHOT Show is hunting and it's any kind of anything to do with hunting, gaming. Also, also uh, police are there. So it's firearms and, and all of that. And it's when a, is that show? It's January and it's international. People from all over the world come in for that show. Um, so we that was that was quite interesting. So that, that was one of the larger. I think they have 60,000 attendees. Typically, that was one of the larger exhibitions like that. that opened up um, early on and trying to figure out how to get the international crowd available to fly in. They, we had just opened up, uh, the United States just opened up to allow internationals to fly in. So it was interesting. Well, where there is a will, there is a way. Um, and now that we are on the other side of it, and of course, meetings are back in full swing and have been, uh, how has that experience really impacted the way that you work? And in your business, how you know, your adrenals collapsed. You had that experience where so many, especially in the events industry, it is a very highly stressed position. How have you looked at that and incorporated wellness and mental health into your own life and and incorporated it instead of trying to seek that that balance? As you said, the event plan, an event planner like I am is probably one of the top it has been usually one of the top three stressful jobs there there is. Uh, I think they stopped actually doing that rating. Forbes used to do it every year yeah. because the same five were the, at the top every year, right? Yeah. Including military police. <laughs> right, exactly. Meeting planners, uh, airline pli pilots, I think. Um, but yeah, so... One it of the top. Be, it can be a lot of fun too. You know, like I'm, I'm having a blast in some of the things that I do. I love working. I'm very blessed that I've had clients that are fun to work with. So even though we go through a really stressful time, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to work through that. But it's a mindset. So, you know, one of the catchphrases that I use is stress is not a badge of honor, nor is it a requirement to get the job done. If you come at it with the intention that, yes, it's a stressful position and I'm so stressed and I just need to get through this event and, you know, all of those programs that we tend to say towards the negative side. But if you look at it the way that you're looking at it, right, it's fun. I choose to do this work. I choose to incorporate really great clients and, and setting those intentions that you are in alignment with your clients and that they are family. These kinds of things that we do have control over. Some people would say we don't, but with your intention and with the words that you speak, you speak life into your work, being fun, being with ease and grace, uh, overcoming obstacles with ease, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you understand the events industry really, really well. Um, I think it's it's a matter of really listening to what people need and want ahead of time. And, you know, my dad always had a quote, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. And it's so true because it listening to what a client wants and, and then thinking about and planning for all the details ahead of time knowing that there's always going to be something that goes wrong. So planning for what might go wrong, um, well, preparing first as much as you possibly can, and then planning for worst case scenarios, knowing too that there's going to be things that pop up that you don't even expect. But planning also for the worst case scenarios is important, um, especially in, in, in a, a, if, if, you, if, if you're part of show management, you really need to understand preparedness for the attendees you know and the pandemic was one example but if, if there's a fire if there is um 
a tornado in some areas of the nation. You know, I, I work events and plan events all around the world, you know, so there's something that's going to be different in Bermuda or the UK or, you know, or in Colorado is, is tornadoes, for instance, when I mentioned tornadoes, you just need to make sure that you plan for those things ahead of time as well when it comes to the safety of your and, and how do you incorporate getting back to kind of your mindset so that you don't get whipped around in the stress? So you are planning and you're preparing, but is there anything that you do to, let's say, within self-care to make sure that you stay on on track, that you you don't get s- swooped away in the stress? Yeah, that's really, you just said a couple of really good things there. Like, how do you, how, so a few things come to mind. Have a good core group of people around you and learn how to communicate what your plans are, what your expectations are, and and get feedback from that group. And also lean in on their talents because you can't do that alone. We can't do anything alone. You know, we can't even, we can't, in my opinion, and and I say this because I work on this all the time. I'm a, quite a solitaire kind of person. I can be what you would might call loner a, a lot. And so I, and it's hard for people to delegate. It's, that's one of the toughest jobs to do, but pulling in the right talent around you and having great conversations and information fed to them ahead of time of what your operational plan is, what the purpose of the event is, who, you know, even when I'm doing the, um, the management for San Diego Wine and Food Festival for the registration management, we bring in a lot of volunteers and temporary staff. Delegating and bringing in good people is part of self-care, as well as admitting what your own needs are. So for instance, with SHOT Show, when I'm on the show floor, I'm there from like 7 a.m. until sometimes 11 o'clock. No, we don't try to do 11 o'clock, but if there's something that needs to get done because, you know, freight is missing or an exhibitor has an emergency or whatever it is, you're working until 11 o'clock at night. Um, so they, the show uh, manager was kind enough to just say, hey, listen, I know you live in town, but would it be easier for you if we booked a hotel room for you on property? And I said, yes, that would be a lot easier. As you know, nowadays, getting around Las Vegas, there's no 20 minute drive any longer. It's 30 to to minutes to an hour, usually that you have to plan. Um, So that, you know, that's part of self-care and getting things done as well. Admitting to yourself what your own needs are. And setting some boundaries of what, what is necessary, what is not, what, um, like the hotel, I, I totally agree. I do the same thing. If I'm working in Vegas, I'm I'm at the property. Um, so how do you start your day? I have um, some little, some, I, I've been very lucky early on in my life with my parents that they've always been very spiritual people. So from a very early age, I've learned about meditation and um, my dad would read books like Ogmandino and Zig Ziglar. And, you know, so I read books like that early on, too. So I've always had that in my life journaling. So in the morning, what I do is I I've a big fan of The Course in Miracles. So I read (laughs) and meditate over the workbook message for the Course of Miracles for that day. And then I also like will ask my light team to give me messages. And I have all these little card decks all around. I'm looking for one here in my room and I can't find it right now. But I, I will pick out a card from my card deck with the voice of my light team. And usually it's almost the same thing that I read in the Course of Miracles. It's so funny how messages are meant for you. Um, and I have, and I have an angel deck too that I, so I have like two decks that I'll pull cards out from. And then I go on my walk where I'm listening to audible for about 30 minutes. And I'm usually listening to podcasts like yours, like Jay Shetty is one of my favorites 
or I'll listen to audible books, some of my favorites like Brene Brown. And, and so that just starts off my day wonderfully. And I'm out in nature and I run across road runners in my way and people walking their dogs and score sometimes an occasional scorpion walking across the path. <laughs> well, that's a messenger for you. Yeah. When they walk across your path. <laughs> yeah. And then, I'll, and then I'll come back and I'll work out a little bit uh, after my walk and then I'm ready for my day. Well, you've said some yummy things that we can dive in on. Um, I love to get someone's background and, and hear about their professional life and how they got to where they are. But what really lights me up is to hear about someone's spiritual connection. And we've worked together, so I do know that you have a spiritual background. But so often we hear about people in their spiritual lives and it's kind of off to the side, whether it's, you know, you go to church on Sunday or you have these spiritual experiences on a retreat. But I like to hear about how it is integrated into someone's life so that we become more fully expressed beings, mind, body, and spirit, and that this is not something that is an off to the side. It's truly who we are. And so you said that you have these, uh, you connect to your light team. So I'd like you to explain, I know what you mean. <laughs> I'd like you to explain what your light team means. We hope you enjoyed part one with Erica Welling and the engaging conversation. While we explored Erica's journey from a small town in Pennsylvania to becoming a prominent figure in the events industry. In part two and three, we discuss the impact of spirituality on personal and professional growth, the challenges faced during the pandemic, and the importance of mindfulness and stress management in high pressure environments. We share our mutual love for the meetings, events, and exhibitions industry, and Erica surprises me with her generous and unexpected promotion of my work. Thank you for hanging out with us. We can't do this without you, so please subscribe and click that notification bell to be reminded when we drop the next episodes. You won't want to miss these juicy morsels of inspiration with Erica. Please check out the description box to access the links and bio of Erica Welling. See you in part two.